Hello and welcome to the Exanti Diet Expert channel once again. Uh, today I, I want to speak with you about the current thinking and advice uh, given out by nutritionists within the NHS. I uh, have been appointed a nutritionist stroke dietitian to work with me. Um, a few months ago when I first started all this uh, diabetes thing. I feel that she's quite eager to send me down the path of bariatric surgery and I must admit it once held some appeal. Uh, it was kind of like proposed as a, a bit like wiping the slate clean in that it would give me a normal sized stomach and not the distended gut that I have formed over years of overeating and eating the wrong things. But there's also a part of me that views that as an admission of defeat and I don't like defeat. Uh, many of my friends and my long-suffering wife would describe me as being infuriatingly stubborn. I spent my life banging my head against brick walls and never giving in. Now whether I'm stubborn or stupid or severely concussed, I'm not getting cut open on an operating table if there's a solution that I can manage to do myself. Consequently, um, I emailed her a few months ago and asked her advice on beginning the Exanti diet or more to the point asking her about a, another similar very low calorie diet um, or total diet replacement called Trihabitual. It was about twice the price of Exante and get this, it had eight different flavours for each of either soups or shakes. That was your lot for three months. She recommended another very low calorie diet, which was even more expensive. Um, and being as I'm no millionaire, I searched on the internet and searching on the internet, I found Exante with its 80 different flavors and formats of porridges, pastas, puddings and packets. And I knew it was the one for me. Uh, the fact that it was a third of the price of the one she'd recommended uh, was mere coincidence, of course. And it, it's been superb. Uh, I dropped 12.2 kilos in the seven weeks leading up to the September challenge. And I know that there's more to come once we get to the end of September and I athletically leap onto the scales once more. <clears throat> but once September is over and the challenge comes to an end, I've decided to go onto a low carbohydrate diet. Now, whether you would call it the keto diet or a low carb diet is I think splitting hairs. Uh, because whichever, it involves a drastic reduction in the amount of carbohydrates consumed and a reliance on opening up the fat stores and using the, the energy within them. And so I emailed my dietitian not to brag at my weight loss or my newly acquired encyclopedic knowledge of the mechanics of nutrition. Uh, or, or, or to, to brag about all things relating to my knowledge of endocrinology, but simply to seek her advice before embarking on a diet as restrictive as one which involves cutting carbs down to below 20% of daily calories. Now, I know that low carb disciples don't like the term calories, but I have been diagnosed as a borderline old fogey and old habits in old fogies die hard. Her advice though astounded me. This, this was in the email reply that she sent to me. I won't do the voice. Following on from my attending the webinar yesterday on lower carb diet latest evidence for type 2 diabetes mellitus. The evidence is that a lower in the studies, this ranged from between 14 and 50% of daily intake. Median was 40%, but lowest was 14% exclamation mark. Carbohydrate diet is effective in the short term up to six months, but no evidence is available over 12 months for reducing HbA1c, fasting glucose and serum triglycerides. If someone does well on a lower carb diet and weight is reducing, the most important aspect 
in gaining control over type 2 diabetes mellitus, then it is fine to carry it on. But you need enough fibre and need to consider the implications for cardiovascular health, the biggest risk factor of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So this involves having plenty of veg, fruit spread throughout the day, wholemeal varieties of bread, rice and pasta, and replace saturated, mostly animal fats, with fish, especially oily, salmon, mackerel and sardines. Pulses, unsalted nuts, seeds, eggs, poultry and veg-based oils, olive and rapeseed. Also, eat unsweetened milk and yogurt. So basically, it's the same advice that's been peddled by the health authorities since the 1970s. I'm sure that the health authorities would suggest that it's merely coincidental that since the 1970s we have suffered a huge increase in obesity and diabetes throughout the populations of countries where this advice was given. And it's as clear as the nose on my face that the advice is flawed and doubly so since I'm a diabetic. So let's break down her advice to me. Plenty of veg and fruit spread throughout the day. No talk of distinguishing between and avoiding starchy vegetables high in sugars or fruits with a high glycemic index value. Uh, no mention that they could cause insulin spikes if eaten in quantity. And of course, no mention that spreading them throughout the day will keep insulation le uh, insulation will keep insulin levels high all day long in reaction. Eat wholemeal varieties of bread, rice, and pasta, which are basically sugars with seeds on. Replace saturated fats with oily fish. So once again, fat is being portrayed as being the culprit. I'm diabetic. If I was lactose intolerant, this is the equivalent of recommending that I drink a glass of milk. I am carbohydrate intolerant. Carbohydrates in me produce insulin spikes and these are damaging my ability to function or and many of my body systems. I need to eliminate them. I need to eat low GI fruit and veg. I need to eat some proteins from fatty cuts of meat and oily fish. And I need to eat plenty of full fat dairy produce with no added sugar. So ice cream is out unfortunately. Dietary fibre is everywhere, not just in grains. There's enough fibre in cauliflower, for instance, to compensate for not eating bread or rice or pasta. My dietitian suggests that there's no evidence of the effect of a low carb diet being effective after six months and that it can lead to cardiovascular problems. Cardio problems, uh, I, I keep saying, I'm diabetic and strokes, heart attacks, blindness and amputations come as part of the diabetes package. And of course, there's a great deal of evidence. During my research into the low carb lifestyle, I found Australian and American studies that produce successful long-term results. And those studies have continued for well over a decade. Our NHS di uh, dietitians have got their heads in the sand. They're recommending outdated and frankly, to people such as me, dangerous nutrition uh, to me and, and others who are extremely vulnerable to the effects of their advice. This is a bloody scandal. Choosing a low carbohydrate future is not a fad diet for a diabetic. It isn't short term. It's a life decision because a return to a reliance on carbohydrates for my nutrition is never going to end well and, and it'd be frankly stupid. Now, to infer that there's no evidence to back up the claim of control over blood sugar 
on a long-term sustained basis is astonishing. To suggest that a 40% carb share of daily food is considered to be low carbohydrate is damning evidence of their lack of understanding or of a suspicious nature in their lack of desire to understand. Research into a low carb, high fat diet has been going on since the 18th century and low carb diets have been recommended ever since then. Low carbohydrate diets were always recommended in the treatment of type two diabetes mellitus until around 1980. And since then, the low fat, high carbohydrate food manufacturers appear to have had a suspiciously high amount of influence on the advice we've been given. The sugar industry began funding research that cast doubt on sugar's role in heart disease, in part by pointing the finger at fat as early as the 1960s, according to an analysis of newly uncovered documents. The resulting article published in 1967 concluded that there was no doubt that reducing cholesterol and saturated fat was the only dietary intervention needed to prevent heart disease. A 2007 review of 206 studies that looked into the health benefits of milk, uh, fizzy pop and fruit juices found that those sponsored entirely by a food or beverage company were four to eight times more likely to show positive health effects from consuming those products. Coca-Cola, for instance, had paid scientists to push the message that exercise was a far more effective weight loss tool than cutting down on food and drink. The beverage giant went so far as to create a non-profit called the Global Energy Balance Network to push the, mer to push the message that Americans spend too much time focusing on cutting calories and not enough time exercising. Uh, following an investigation by the New York Times, the non-profit announced it was disbanding. In a bid to be more transparent, the Coca-Cola Corporation revealed that it had spent $132.8 million on scientific research and partnerships between 2010 and 2015. There are, of course, many other instances of companies with a vested interest paying influencers. In this case, nutritional scientists to spread a how should I put this? Um, a skewed version of the truth that finds in favour of those that paid for the research. According to foodpolitics.com, between March and October 2015, 76 industry funded studies were identified, and of those 76, 70 reported results favourable to the sponsor's interest. Now, I make no apology for the American slant to the information I'm presenting. Uh, many of the major companies involved in, in my opinion, feeding nutritionally poor and damaging products to their own customers are Americans. But they also operate here. Now, you can decide for yourself whether or not food manufacturers in the UK have the same mutually beneficial relationship with researchers and nutritional advisors. The UK food and beverage market is worth more than 100 billion pounds. So, what do you think? And when it comes to advice, do you really think you can trust what you see and hear and read, knowing that the recommendations you receive as to a food's safety and nutritional value may well have been sponsored by the very same manufacturers that produced it? My conclusions are that our NHS nutritionists are way behind the curve and possibly deliberately so. They are suggesting that we eat a diet that has been shaped by research paid for by the very same food manufacturers that process the items that they suggest. They ignore clear evidence and make suggestions that are more likely to cause even greater damage. The treatments that they do offer 
do nothing to solve the problem, but merely control the symptoms. Now, it seems to me that the system is broken and that there appears to be nobody trustworthy enough to give the truth. And so I'm left to make up my own mind. So I'm going to go low carb because it is, in the main, high levels of carbs that have caused my insulin resistance, and my diabetes and my obesity. I have, of course, played a major role in putting my health in such danger. I'm no innocent victim. I've been foolish and I've ignored the warning signs. But I'm determined to rectify the situation to lose weight and to reverse my diabetes. I plan to live a healthier life, confining myself to eating foods which have been nowhere near a factory wherever possible. I plan to include more physical activity wherever possible and as much as possible, but I'm not interested in living a long life if there's no enjoyment. And equally so, I'm not interested in enjoyment if it impacts the length of my life. The end result of all this, of course, is immutable. I will eventually die. I can't change that. But what I can change is when. Thanks for listening. Chat soon.